our study of earth magnets has generated more problems and more questions than it has solutions and laws. What makes magnetite and the other iron oxides of its family magnetic? Why iron? Why a little bit of nickel and not so much most of anything else on the periodic table except neodymium for some reason in weird quantities and chemical combinations? Why does the Earth have a magnetic field? And if it does, which way do the arrows go? What makes certain things magnetic and other things not magnetic? None of these questions were answered until 1820 when Danish physicist Hans Christian Ørsted kept an incredibly messy lab bench and accidentally answered them for us. Orsted was giving a lecture at the University of Copenhagen in April of 1820 when he noticed something interesting on his lab bench. It was a welcome distraction, I make no secret of it, because the lecture was horrifically boring. Even Hans Christian Orsted himself thought it was incredibly boring. He had absolutely nothing new under the sun to tell the people he was presenting to. But as Orsted turned on his equipment, he noticed that a compass that he happened to have left on the lab bench went haywire every time he switched his circuit on and again when he switched it off. I'm sorry to say the audience didn't notice a thing, uh, but Orsted did and spent the next three months wondering why on earth whenever he brought a compass needle near a circuit, a circuit that was changing somehow, changing from on to off, changing from off to on, or changing the position of the electrons, that is to say it had a current flowing through it, the compass needle would go nuts. Compasses, as we know, point in the direction of a magnetic field. And three months later, Orsted published his results privately um, because if he was going to turn out to be a laughingstock and be ridiculously wrong, he only wanted to be embarrassed in front of other scientists. But the conclusion was clear. This circuit, this battery, despite having no magnetite, no iron of any kind, has a magnetic field. We can set up compasses around a current carrying wire send a current through the wire and move the compasses around to different locations to measure the direction of the magnetic field. Compasses do have arrows. They have one end that points north and one end that points south. Interestingly enough, um, if you'll go over your physics, you'll realize that it's the south pole that points north and the north pole that points south. Lots and lots of experiments in 2D yielded absolutely nothing, uh, but when the scientists started to work in 3D, they saw the pattern clearly. Now, we've never ever had any success at the lab at RZJHS in replicating this pattern, but notice that we only work with one wire and one set of batteries at the time. If we have a much stronger current, we'll see the iron filings swinging around to make the field lines, and then the direction of the compass needles will make sense. It is clear that the magnetic field around a current carrying wire runs in concentric circles all around, perpendicular to the direction of the current. We've already had a case of one physics effect that occurs in a perpendicular plane. That's torque, that's the vector cross product, and we have a tool for a perpendicularometer. We have the right hand rule from math class. We're going to use the high speed version for electromagnetism. Find something that is straight. In this case, the wire is straight. Get your right angle here on your right hand. Lefties, work away. Righties, put your pencil down. Run your thumb along the direction of the current, and your fingers will curl in the direction of the magnetic field, concentric circles radiating outward from the current carrying wire, such that um, they decrease in magnitude as you get further away from the wire. Here's the right-hand rule for the straight wire, and now we know which way the arrows go. We know that with a current flowing up in a positive direction, the magnetic field rotates counterclockwise by the sign convention that we all share. Um, if you get as far as Ampere's law in calculus, you'll find the strength of the magnetic field is directly proportional to the strength of the current, inversely proportional to how far away you are from the wire, based on the magnetic permeability of free space, mu naught. If you're finding yourself a little 
lost at sea in all that ocean of mathematics, that's okay. You won't need this till next year. Here is what Hans Christian Oersted discovered in plain English. Changing electric fields create magnetic fields. Write that down. Add it to your notes with your diagram of the right-hand rule and your diagram of the magnetic field lines around a bar magnet. Changing electric fields create magnetic fields. If for some reason that seems a little bit of an odd way to summarize Hans Christian Oersted's experiment, you can also write the other version, namely, electric currents create magnetic fields. Why not write them both? Changing electric fields create magnetic fields. Electric currents create magnetic fields. What's the connection? Well, electric current means the charges are moving. If the charges are moving, then the field is changing as the charges move. It's much easier to look and say, hey, there's an electric current. Take out your compass. I guarantee it has a magnetic field. However, there's a second principle of electromagnetism that once Orsted knew what he was looking for, he found it incredibly easy to discover, and that's why I like this version. Changing electric fields create magnetic fields. In the next lecture, we'll look for another principle to keep this one company. See if you can hypothesize what it is. Now that we have two kinds of field lines, it's important to be clear on the differences between them. First and foremost, there is no such thing as magnetic charge. Magnets are not charged. Everything in the lab today has been neutral except the electric current. Magnets have a north pole and a south pole. Fun fact that you may or may not have noticed with the iron filings, magnetic field lines always form closed loops. The fuzzy stuff that you saw with the iron filings at the top of the bar magnet was actually a field line that was so big it went off the page. Anything you're drawing with magnetic fields is going to loop around and make a closed loop. If you run out of space on the page, just be aware that the field lines keep going outside it. Like electric field lines, magnetic field lines never cross. And again, line density represents field strength. You can see that the field is much stronger here right by the poles than it is out here in space. Direction is determined by the right-hand rule, and if you have more than one magnet or more than one source of magnetic fields, you'll add them with vectors as usual. Now, let's give her right-hand rule a little bit of a workout. What if the wire is not straight? Good news, your perpendicularometer still works even if the wires are curled. Next year, you'll do the calculus problem with a vector sum on all these magnetic fields for current going around in a loop. And you'll discover that right in the middle, these on this side cancel out those on this side, and the net direction of the field is straight through. We did a very similar problem for Coulomb's law when we found that in two dimensions, the net force in between two charges was zero, and the only possible direction for a force was into or out of the page. If you do this for dozens of circles, all the same, with current flowing this way around through your screen, you will find out that you get a nice straight magnetic field going through the center. This means you have a secondary right-hand rule. You, we said if the wire was straight, use your thumb. If the wire is curved, that's good, use your fingers. Curl your fingers in the direction of the current, and your thumb will give you the nice straight magnetic field right through the center. Is this magnetic field starting to look a little bit familiar? Maybe like something you saw in the lab yesterday? Good. Add the diagrams to your notes. This is the magnetic field around a loop of wire. This is magnetic field around a coil of wire, which we can use a fancy word solenoid if we don't think we're going to get any funding for just saying a coil of wire. The implications of this are pretty amazing industrially. We're saying that we can set up a current in a coil of wire. It's got to be a coil if we want a straight magnetic field. And by running current through a coil, as we said, first principle of electromagnetism, electric currents create magnetic fields. We can make a magnet where no magnetite existed before. Now, a magnetic field is magnetism in potential. We need something to actually be the magnet. I give you one guess, just one, for what ordinary kind of non-magnetic metal is going to be susceptible to magnetism, and then we can create what is called an electromagnet. Add to your notes, 
an electromagnet is a temporary magnet. It can be turned on and off at will, as opposed to a permanent magnet, the kind you have on your fridge, that is magnetic forever, unless it's a cheap piece of you-know-what, in which case it wasn't all that permanent of a magnet to begin with, and its end destiny is the trash. Check it out. Dr. Edwards is doing the demo that we do in class. I use a cheap screwdriver, six for a dollar from the dollar store. He uses an ordinary nail from the hardware store. What he's done um, is wound lots and lots and lots of coils of wire. Notice it's got green insulation so that the current goes round and round instead of going straight through. Hooks up the two ends to an ordinary 9-volt battery. Takes the nail and discovers that instantly it's a magnet. He can pick up paper clips, steel balls. Can't pick up um, coins that don't have iron or nickel in them. Notice the quarter doesn't work, but the nickel works beautifully. And when he wants to put them down, he can disconnect the wires and turn the magnet off. The industrial applications of this are incredible. Think about it. A force that you can turn on and turn off at will. A force that is exactly as strong as the kind of current that you are able to supply. These two inventors um, are stealing parts from old broken microwaves, namely the transformers inside, which, as you'll learn later, have coils with thousands and thousands of loops of wire. They're mounting them to add, and once they have all those coils of wire set up to run an incredibly high current, they will have a much bigger and stronger electromagnet than we can make on the tabletop with a nail or a screwdriver um, and a couple dozen coils of wire. And once their giant electromagnet is done, they are going to find themselves able to lift hundreds of pounds when they turn on the magnet and put it down when they turn the magnet off. Think of the lifting power of things previously unmovable by human power, by ox power alone, you can pick it up, put it wherever you want, and put it down. Check it out. Now, let's return to our big questions. Now that we have this force within our control, now that we can explain why it happens. Fundamentally, magnetic fields are created by changing electric fields. Which direction it happens? Right hand rule and we're able to control the strength and the direction of the field however we like, we are ready to explain why it happens and go back to the question of permanent magnets and see what their secret is. What makes certain materials magnetically susceptible and others are not? The answer has to lie somewhere in changing electric fields because that's the only thing we know of that create magnetic fields. Fact. All charges move. Specifically, electrons move. Electrons move all over the place. That means every single electron must have a little baby magnetic field of its own. It's so small, it's really silly to call it a magnetic field, and soon we're going to be using the words magnetic domains to describe the little baby magnetic field caused by a moving electron. Fact. If you have an even number of electrons and they're all moving in opposite directions, your net magnetic field from all of that is probably going to be zero at least some of the time. Electrons are spinning too, so it's never going to be really, really, really zero. But if you have an odd number of electrons, lots of unpaired net electrons, means that you're likely going to have a net spin to say nothing of a net angular momentum going all over the place, and that's going to lead to a net magnetic field. Now, the crystal structure in solids, some metallic liquids, but it's, it's mainly solids here, um, encourages the formation of these magnetic domains. That is to say, in English, electrons spinning together. The term comes from chemical potential energy, and in the chemical potential energy equation for each atom in the crystal and the crystal as a whole, there's a term for, it's called crystal repulsion pressure. And the crystal repulsion pressure term means that it is often advantageous for electrons to be spinning in the same direction as their neighbors, that is to say, it lowers their potential energy. 
That means work is done. That means they have more energy. In order to spin in a different direction than most of their neighbors, they would have to raise their potential energy. That means they would have to do work to spin in a different direction, which is why sooner or later, many of them discovered that it is advantageous to begin spinning in the same direction as their neighbors and stay there. How did they get there? Eh, sheer statistics. They're in one dimension alone, going around the plane, there are 360 um, directions an electron could be going. Now run through all of that in 3D and you'll find out that sooner or later, um, by sheer happenstance running through all the random numbers, there will be a point when two neighboring electrons in neighboring atoms are spinning in the same direction. If they're in a magnetically susceptible material, they'll discover that it's their, to their advantage to do so. In fact, they'll have to do work to stop spinning in the same direction, with the conclusion that the electrons end up spinning in the same directions. In normal materials, materials that are not magnetically susceptible, these directions are randomly oriented all over the place. Some electrons are spinning this way, some electrons are spinning that way, some electrons are spinning that way. Add up a million different random numbers, know that they're really random, half of them are going to be negative, and you will get zero. There is no macroscopic magnetic field in normal non-magnetically susceptible materials. But in permanent magnets, the chemical potential energy of that particular compound in that particular crystal is set up that there is a huge energy difference between all the electrons spinning in the same direction and not. Sooner or later, every electron that sp tries spinning in that direction will discover that it's so profitable to do so and never wants to do any. Let's take a look at what's going on in all these different materials at the subatomic level. We'll draw the protons first. Protons are easily protons don't move. They stay in the nucleus, minding their own business. Yeah, they spin, but honestly, if you're looking for moving charges create magnetic fields, if you're looking for changing electric fields, the electric fields of the protons sitting there minding its own business don't change that much. There they are, they're protons, they stay. The moving ones, the ones whose magnetic fields change, first of all, they change by going from here to here, are the electrons. Let's say Heisenberg uncertainty, we don't really know which way the electrons are going. Maybe this one's going this way, and this one's going that way, and this one's going this way, and this one's going that way, and this one's going up on some weird diagonal, and this one's going down on some weird diagonal, and this one's going this way, and this one's going that way. Well, we can do the right-hand rule for every single one of these electrons. Practice. Lefties, you're good to go. Righties, put your pen down and draw. If the electron is spinning this way, coming out of the screen and into it again, its magnetic field should be pointing up. If the electron is spinning out of the screen and down, the magnetic field should be pointing left. If the electron is spinning this way, that's the opposite of what we had before, magnetic field pointing down. This one is the opposite of what we had before, the magnetic field should be pointing to the right. Hey, I'm starting to recognize the pattern here. This is just perpendicular to the direction of the spin. This way, that way, this way, that way. Now, add up all those tiny little magnetic domains. Add up all those arrows, and what do you see? This one cancels that one. This one cancels that one. These two cancel each other. These two cancel each other. This is why in normal materials, there is no net magnetic field. Notes this way with three sets of notes all lined up together like this for the three different materials. Normal materials, where the electrons spin randomly. Permanent magnets, the word we're going to be learning for that is ferromagnetic. Really, it's strongly ferromagnetic because magnetism is a continuum. It's not an on and off button. It's not a question of you have it or you don't. It's like being a conductor or an insulator. An insulator is a material with very high resistance. A conductor is a material with very low resistance. It's a continuum. 
Let's go to the opposite end of the continuum and take notes on the opposite case, the case of magnetite and other permanent magnets. What's different about these materials and the other materials is that the electrons spin together. Why? Chemistry. As I'll explain, it has something to do with the crystal repulsion pressure, but the electrons have discovered that if they spin together, they will have lower chemical potential energy than if they don't. And as each one spins in all sorts of different directions, tries 360 different ways, and eventually happens upon this one, they'll discover that it's very much to their advantage to stay spinning this way. As I'll explain, things naturally lower in potential energy, but they won't raise potential energy unless they do mechanical work to get that energy from somewhere. Ferromagnetic materials, strongly ferromagnetic materials, are materials whose electrons all spin together. Now, check it out, we only need one right-hand rule problem. Electrons spinning this way, out of the screen, that means the little magnetic fields, we're gonna call them magnetic domains, are pointing upward. Now, add all of those magnetic fields together and see what you get. They're all pointing up. You're gonna get a huge, strong external magnetic field. It's going to be so big that you can feel its effects even outside the magnet. There it goes. Now, this arrow has two ends, and the ends have very technical terms, very fancy language. You'll probably have trouble spelling it, but you can pause the video and you can go back. The end with the arrow is called north. The end without the arrow is called south. That's what they mean. That's it. You will never find an arrow that does not have an end with a triangle and an end without the triangle. Try it this way, that's not an arrow, that's just a house. Try it this way, that's not an arrow, that's just a rectangle. It's definitional. Every magnet has a north pole and a south pole. If you go down to the level of the individual electrons, you'll see them there, just the same, the north pole and the south pole. Cut a magnet in half. Break it so you can get a north pole by itself. You won't get a north pole by itself. Check it out. Here's the end without an arrow. You'll get north, south, north. There's the end with the arrow again, south. You will get two permanent magnets. You can't destroy a magnet by cutting it in half. You can't destroy it by breaking it into pieces. It is magnetized down to the level of individual electrons. It's like the broomsticks in the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Chop them up and you'll just get more broomsticks. You'll get more little arrows. If you want to demagnetize a material, you might have some success, if it's not very strongly ferromagnetic, of um, not only chopping them in, into little bits, but grinding the bits and jumping on them and shaking them, as you'll see me do to compass needles in the classroom when I find a compass that's devoutly pointing west. I give it a good shaking and hope that it will behave itself. Or boiling them, I've told, has some kind of success. The point is you're jumbling the electrons up, and if they're all jumbled up, maybe some of them will start spinning in different directions. And that's where we have the intermediate category, magnetically susceptible materials. Very weakly magnetically susceptible materials that don't do this naturally, that can be convinced are called paramagnetic. Strongly magnetically susceptible materials um, that are well known for their interactions with magnets are weakly ferromagnetic. Notice the ferromagnetic, the kind of magnetism you see in an iron chain or in the steel door of, let's see, what do we stick magnets onto? These materials, just like normal magnetic materials, have no independent magnetic field. That is, when found in nature, their electrons are swirling every which way, up, down, and all around. However, they can spin together if given a good reason to do so. And the good reason to do so is an external magnetic field. 
if you place a weakly ferromagnetic material, if you place a piece of iron, if you place your fridge in a magnetic field, those electrons will begin to spin in the same direction as the electrons in the magnetic field below. And that means the magnetic field will extend inside the new material and it will continue. Notice that this end is south. South lines up with north. That means they're going to be attracted and thus the magnet sticks to the fridge. Now let's be clear. This is magnetically susceptible. This is an actual magnet. You cannot use your fridge to stick a fridge to another fridge. That would be duct tape. But you can use a magnet to stick a magnet to the fridge because as you bring in the permanent magnet, the magnetic field from the permanent magnet permeates into the interior of the metal. If I stick a magnet to the whiteboard in the classroom, then somewhere deep, deep in the whiteboard, and I don't know if it's micrometers or millimeters or meters, there is a south pole to go with the south pole I brought in and a north pole lined up right up against the south to match anything else, and all the magnetic domains are going to look the same. Here's a vector diagram, the microscopic view of magnetic domains in a normal material. There are magnetic domains, but they're very small. They're, they don't do much, and you add them all together. This field's going to cancel out that field. This field's going to cancel out that field. Add them all off, you're not going to get a net magnetic field. However, certain materials can be magnetized. Check it out. This is footage from an electron microscope of iron filings like substances that we played with on the Etch a Sketch boards yesterday. Black means that the um, solids are pointing straight up, white means they're pointing straight down. You can see the weird sort of scrabbly diagonal lines. This is a magnetically susceptible material, and someone is waving a magnet over it. You can see the magnetic domains aligning as all the electrons discover it's in their advantage to spin counterclockwise in the XZ plane so that the magnetic field is pointing up. Here's a static shot from the same experiment. Um, you can see the magnetic domains that are oriented sideways, and you can see the ups which are black and the downs which are white in a normal material. Wicked cool, huh? Now let's learn some very complicated vocabulary words. The end with the arrow is called north. The end without the arrow is called south. These are technical terms. That's what they mean. All magnetic fields flow in loops. If you're going to get a straight magnetic field, it's because you have a current loop. It's because an electron or another charge is going round and around. By definition, look inside. The end with the arrow is north. The end without the arrow is south. This means inside the magnet where you cannot stick your fingers, fields definitionally run from south to north. That doesn't do you any good at all because it's inside a piece of solid iron oxide ore. Outside, where you can stick your fingers, the circle has to close. The field has to go back north to south again. So pause the video, update your notes, put directional arrows on your magnetic field of a bar magnet. Whew. That's a pretty good day's work. Let's review big picture. Magnetism is a force exerted by a moving charge. That is to say, changing electric fields create magnetic fields. Magnetism is totally different from electricity. It is in addition to any positive and negative attract repel. It's exerted by other charges that are in motion. The magnetic field permeates through space the same way the electric field does. The magnetic field flows perpendicular to the electric field. Magnetic field lines don't represent a path of motion, and they don't represent the force experienced by a moving charge. So, what are they? They represent the way a circulating current will be torqued. Check it out. Here's a series circuit. Here's the battery. Here's the switch. Whoa! See how those wires repel each other? Send the current the other way, they attract. Current one way, repel. Current the other way, attract. 
That's what the magnetic field lines are telling. We don't have time in this curriculum to fully investigate the equations for magnetic force when you're setting up particle by particle or current by current in a cyclotron or in an electromagnet. Uh, but those of you preparing for outside assessment um, will know that the units of magnetic field are the Tesla and that the force on a charged particle, that's a vector quantity of Q, V cross B, directly proportional to the charge, bigger charge is more force, directly proportional to the velocity of the charge. If it's moving faster, uh, it will be a stronger force, and it's also directly proportional to the strength of the magnetic field running perpendicular to the charge. If you're doing this with a wire and not electron by electron, um, you should be integrating the current along the length of the wire that is running perpendicular to the magnetic field at every point. Use the right hand rule for direction. If the charge is going this way and the magnetic field is coming out of the page, then the force is going to be down for a positive charge and up for a negative charge. All of this is commonly used in magnetic levitation, which uses electromagnets to make a repulsive force between the train and the rails, allowing the train to move very, very, very quickly with very little kinetic energy lost because there's no work done by friction. The kinetic energy that you give the train to start with will be reduced a little bit. By air resistance. Notice that these are called bullet trains for a reason because they're so streamlined. But other than air resistance, you shouldn't need to power the train at all between Tokyo and Kyoto other than the energy you need to apply the brakes and stop it when it gets to the station. Magnetic levitation trains are ridiculous ridiculously expensive in terms of setting up the basic infrastructure because you need these powerful electromagnets running a very, very high current all along the track. But after you've invested the initial capital to set up the system, they pay for themselves and represent a huge energy savings as the decades go by. Notice that the two countries to get bullet trains running first in the world were Germany and Japan. Think for a second. Think what you've learned in history. What do those company, the, what do those countries in the 20th century have in common? Press play when you're ready. That's right. Since World War II, Germany and Japan have been forbidden to have standing armies because we saw what happened the last time. Therefore, they have billions of dollars of equivalent capital to invest in civil infrastructure and civil engineering, and these are the results. China now has many bullet trains running as well. We here in North America are tremendously behind the eight ball in terms of this wonderful technology.